Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. Happy Father's Day. Happy sixth day of VBS. It's a great day here. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, chapters 1 and 2. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They will be glad to give you one. That can be uh, our Father's Day gift to you. In preparation for today's Father's Day message, uh, I, I came across an article written by a fellow by the name of Chris Hines. I found it to be a rather intriguing piece, and I wanted to share with you the opening paragraph. He writes, sometimes when we want to compliment a good father, we say, he's such an involved father. We like that he's involved with his family, plays with his kids, listens to them. But never once have I heard, she's such an involved mother. That's not something we celebrate. Why is this? I think we expect mothers to be involved. It goes with the position. It's part of being a mom. To acknowledge an involved mother is stating the obvious. There's no need to be redundant. And there's no need to celebrate when she does what she's supposed to do. After all, I never congratulate the sun for setting. I just expect it to set. But it's different with fathers, isn't it? We really don't expect fathers to be that involved. We have a different standard for them. Fathers are the second string parent, the understudy. They go in when mom is sick or perhaps impaled by a Lincoln log, <laughs> but only until she's better. And then dad returns to the background. Ouch. Ouch. Gentlemen, uh, today is an unapologetic call for all of us as fathers to get in the game. You know, the t-shirts, the theme for this year's VBS was game changer. And I believe that God expects us as dads to be game changers in the lives of our children, our grandchildren. But here's the deal. You can't be a game changer unless you are in the game. And too many of us are leaving the game to mom. And so today we're going to step it up. And as our role model, we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. No doubt about it, Joseph was a dad who was in the game. And thank goodness he was. I mean, after all, he had only been given the single most important fathering job in history to be the earthly father of the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Yeah, Joseph was in the game, and we are so glad that he was. And there are several aspects to uh, Joseph's parenting that uh, I want us to look at this morning. Two things in particular that reveal that he was, in fact, in the game, and then one very important outcome to the proactivity, to the involvement, to the fact that he was in the game. The first thing that we notice about Joseph is that he was attentive to God. First step he took in being in the game was to be attentive to God. Look with me in Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. 
Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. You know, I don't think it was uh, accidental or purely on a whim that Joseph was chosen to be the earthly father of Jesus. I don't think it was uh, just like God saying, okay, let's see, we got to have somebody. So, ah, uh, Joseph, boom, you're it. No, I... Not by a long shot. For one thing, God never does anything by accident. Never does anything on a whim. God is intentional. Which tells me that God was looking for just the right person to give the most important fathering job in history. He's going to be looking for just the right man. He's going to take tremendous care and whoever it is that is be selected to fulfill this role. He's not just going to hand it out to any old body. Much in the same way that you and I take tremendous care even in the selection of a babysitter who has minimal influence over our children. We want to know everything we can know about this babysitter. I'm sure God took great care in the selection of Joseph. He wanted to go with a known quantity. He wanted to go with someone that he knew he could trust, which tells me that God knew Joseph, and Joseph knew God. Joseph had been attentive to God. God was not a sideline in his life, not an afterthought, but Joseph was well acquainted with God. They had a relationship. Joseph understood the ways of God. He put his faith and his trust in God. You could say he was a man of God. I can't imagine that God would choose anybody, any less connected, in order to be the earthly father of his one and only son. If we want to be in the game with our children, the first and the best thing that you and I as dads can do for them is to get in the game with God. To know the ways of God. To have that relationship with Him. To be growing in that relationship with Him. Why, why is this so important? Why is this so significant? Well, I can think of several reasons. First of all, if you have been a dad for more than one week, you've already clued into the fact that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Those babies don't come home with an instruction manual. They don't hand them out at the hospital. And what caring, loving father among us has not had that moment of stunning realization? Oh my gosh, I am responsible for this child. I'm to be the provider for this child. The thought that went through my mind when we brought our eldest into the world was, oh my goodness, this child is going to be looking at me 24-7 and I am the biggest idiot who ever lived. We don't know what we're doing. In fact, we don't even know what we don't know. That's how far behind the eight ball we are. But just because we don't know what we are doing doesn't mean that God doesn't know what he's doing. God knows exactly what we need to be the kind of dad that our children need. God has the wisdom and the patience, and the strength, and the endurance, and all of the things that are necessary in order to be a dad who is in the game. And God has them in abundance, and it's a good thing, because by and large for us, we are in short supply. No, we desperately need to be attentive to God, because you and I, we, we don't know what we're doing. Another reason that we need to be attentive to God is because of the temptation that all of us face 
to fall back on a lesser substitute than God. You know, we're gonna pay attention to something. We're gonna be looking somewhere, some way, somehow to find whatever it is we don't have. And if we are not first looking at him, we're gonna settle for something else. And by and large, most of us, I believe, settle, and I do mean settle, for the wisdom that is found in ourselves. We haven't learned what God thinks about things, so we're just gonna do the best that we can. And friends, that is a long, long way short from the wisdom of God. Here's the thing about men. You listening, ladies? Not gonna tell you anything you don't already know. Particularly with children, men tend to do what is expedient. What is gonna solve the problem in the moment? Men were not gifted with this ability to think globally. We're not inclined to be creatures who look down the line and think, well, this might be the possible consequence of this action. No, we just see, oh no, this is the problem. This is how we solve it. This is what we're gonna do right now. That's not wisdom, friends. That's not wisdom. From time to time, I, I hear people make the statement, you know, if I could go back and live my life again, I wouldn't change a single thing. I don't know what planet they're living on. <laughs> there's plenty that I would change, and there's plenty about my parenting, my fatherhood, that I would change. I've made loads of mistakes, but you know, there's one in particular that comes back to my mind far too often. Back when our girls were small, uh, I was home one day, Becky was at work at the hospital, and so there I was with the girls. And at one point during the day, they came to me and said, Dad, would you play with us? And in all of my wisdom, I said, you know what, girls? Daddy's really busy today. I've got a sermon I've got to write, and I've got to cut the grass, and I've got to run air. I... That day's gone forever. And young fathers, let me just tell you, when it's gone, it's gone. And I give my right arm to go back and say, yeah, let's play. Let's play. That would have been wisdom. But I relied on my own infant, uh, my own finite wisdom and robbed them and robbed myself of a chance to be the kind of dad that they needed me to be. We need to be attentive to God because he knows more than we do. And if we're not putting him first, we're going to fall back on our own wisdom. And that is such a poor substitute. And then a third reason I would say we need to be attentive to God is because we want to leave our children a legacy of being attentive to God. They don't just need to hear that it's important to be attentive to God. They need to see it. They can hear all about it in kids' ministry. They can hear about its importance in vacation Bible school. They can hear about its importance in student ministry. But there's only one place they can see it day after day after day, and that's with us. And what sort of life are we living in front of them? Are we living a life that's paying attention to everything under the sun except for what matters most? Running here and yon, expending energy, using resources, wasting time on things that are here today and gone tomorrow, or are we investing in the eternal in such a way that our children are noticing? And as they become adults and begin to raise children of their own, they too will be men and women who are attentive to God. I don't know about you, but that's what I so want for my children and my grandchildren and generations to come. Joseph was attentive to God. And, and you and I 
are the beneficiaries of that because he set a trajectory in Jesus' life. He demonstrated for Jesus, this is what a man is. And a man makes a priority to pay attention to God. And throughout his life and his earthly ministry, Jesus was a man who paid attention to God and ultimately was able to accomplish his task of the salvation of the world in some measure because his father showed him paying attention to God is important. A second thing that we notice in the life of Joseph, not only was he attentive to God, but he was obedient to God. You know, it's not enough enough to pay attention to God. There's got to be follow through. And with Joseph, there was, particularly when it was not easy. On, On two occasions in particular, Joseph had an incredibly difficult choice before him. And in each, he did the right thing. The hard right versus the easy wrong. The first one we just read about in his decision to wed Mary. The second one took place after Jesus was born. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, Jesus has been born, the magi, the wise men have come for a visit and have just left. Picking up in verse 13, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Can you imagine? I mean... Joseph and Mary were not from, they did not at that point in time live in Bethlehem. The the only reason they were in Bethlehem was because Caesar Augustus had declared that everybody in the empire had to go back to their hometown and register for a census. They actually lived far north from there in Nazareth. That's where he had a carpentry business. And I would imagine during that whole sojourn there in Bethlehem while Jesus was being born, there were probably any number of times that Joseph thought to himself, boy, I can't wait to get back home, back in my own bed, back to earning some money to provide for my family. I'm sure, especially after Jesus was born, his thoughts were turning homeward and then, no, I want you to go to Egypt. What? I don't even know the way. I mean, who's going to pay for me to get there? What are we going to eat along the way? How do I know that I'll be able even to get in? And once I'm in, where will we live? Will I be able to find a job there? You know, the Bible is incredibly terse when it comes to telling stories But if you just use your sanctified imagination, you can begin to fill in some of these details. What dad among us would not be thinking these very things? I'm going to another country tomorrow. A place I've never been and I don't know the first thing about. What am I going to do? But Joseph was obedient. He was not only obedient... To marry Jesus' mother, he was obedient to go to Egypt when God told him to go. And I'm sure it was no picnic. He chose the hard right over the easy wrong. He chose commitment over preference. And for me, that's a good definition of parenting in a nutshell. Commitment over preference. Again, if you've parented for more, much more than about a week, you've realized, hmm, what's it going to be, me or the child? If we're going to get in the game with our kids, dads, not only do we have to be paying attention to the ways of God, we have to then follow through with obedience. Even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. 
Because our children need to live in an environment where dad is not blown about by every wind that comes along. Where we know dad is dependable, dad is reliable, dad will do the right thing. And the day after day after day choice to walk in obedience to God establishes an environment of blessing for our children. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but that's exactly what it does. First of all, it gives to our children the blessing of stability. Stability. Knowing there is a safe place for me in this world. Home is predictable. Home is safe and good and right. And day after day, I see my dad and my mom making right decisions, choosing to follow God, even when it's not easy to do so. That establishes a sense of stability in a child like nothing else can. And our world desperately needs it. Our prisons are full to overflowing of young men and young women whose dads chose the easy way out, who chose preference over commitment. Poverty and homelessness are on the rise in the United States because too many dads chose preference over commitment. Our children need a sense of stability. Our culture needs a sense of stability. And dads, you and I, have been given the unique task of being present in the lives of our children each and every day and demonstrating for them following God, even when it's hard, is the right thing to do. There's a peace and a comfort that comes from that that can't come from anywhere else. It gives them not only the blessing of stability, but it also gives them the blessing of preparation for the future. (laughs) Little boys learn how to be men by watching their dads. Watching the decisions that their dads make, the choices that their dads make. And when day after day they see their dads making good, godly, obedient choices, they're going to grow up as confident, capable young men. Girls need to see their dads making good, right, honorable, obedient choices day after day. Understanding what it means to be an honorable woman. Understanding what it means to be a godly woman. Because the man that they love and respect the most has modeled it for them each and every day through his obedience to God. Our children need that from us. And when we do not provide it, the consequences are so far reaching. There are too many boys in men's bodies today who don't know how to be men because dad didn't model it. And they're filled with unidentified anger and frustration because something deep inside of them tells them, I need to be something. I need to be doing something, but I don't know who I'm supposed to be. I don't know what I'm supposed to do because nobody showed me how. And so they live a life of frustration and anger to the detriment of themselves, their families, and society. And when we fail to live lives of obedience before our daughters and fail to give them the stability that they need, when dad is in and out of the picture and choosing preference over commitment, something is lost in the life of a young lady that can never be regained. She didn't get the commitment and the love and the dependability that she needed from dad. And so she goes and she looks for it somewhere else in all of the wrong places. And her self-esteem and her confidence takes a hit. And I have sat with far too many boys and girls in men and women's bodies because dad chose not to be attentive to God and chose not to be obedient to God. Brothers, God is calling us to get in the game. He wants us to listen to him and he wants us to obey him. 
And in the life of Joseph, not only do we see what we should be doing, but we also see a very, very important outcome. Not only was Joseph attentive to God and obedient to God, but ultimately he was honored by God. Right smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, (coughs) Jesus teaches us how to pray. The Lord's Prayer is what we call it today. And the first two words of that prayer are familiar to all of us. What are they? Our Father. Now, perhaps we don't understand it today, but for the original listeners to that sermon, that was unbelievable. That someone would address God as our Father. Because up until that time in the life of your average Jew, God was someone to be afraid of. You didn't write or speak his name aloud. Nobody but a select few were even allowed to go into his house, the temple. Nothing, nothing remotely was communicated to say that we should look at God as a father. And yet along comes Jesus. And he tells folks, This is how I want you to think about God. And he comes up with the most beautiful, accessible word picture that he possibly could. That of a good, loving father. Something that everyone could relate to back then and today. And even if we didn't have a good and loving father ourselves, we can at least comprehend what that person should be like. And so Jesus gives us this incredible understanding, this incredible new understanding of who God is. Well, where do you think he got that image? He got it from Joseph. If Joseph had been a loser, a jerk, a no-count father, might that have been the first image that popped into Jesus' mind when he's trying to teach people this is what God is like? No, in a very real sense, Jesus was saying, so what is God like? You know, God is like my dad. My dad is like God. What a beautiful honor to extend to Joseph. All of those years of being attentive to God and being obedient to God were summed up in that one beautiful honor that Jesus extended to him. Thank you, Dad, for giving me that gift of what a dad should be like so that when I teach it to these people, I'm speaking out of my own experience. Now, perhaps you think to yourself, well, you know, good and fine for Joseph. I seriously doubt my children will be teaching anyone a prayer that Christians will recite for thousands of years because of me. And I'm not going to argue that point. Of course not. That was a singular moment in history. But it's not the only way that Jesus honored Joseph. The other way that Jesus And that God honored Joseph was Jesus growing up to become the man that God destined and purposed him to be. Growing up to be a man who was attentive to God. Growing up to be a man who would choose the hard right over the easy wrong. And when he knelt in Gethsemane and the choice was there before him to die for the sins of the world or to run, what did he choose? He chose the cross. He chose to die for you and for me. That our sins might be forgiven. That we might receive the gift of eternal life. And in some small measure, some small measure, that attentiveness and that obedience can be traced right back to Joseph who surely was the father that Jesus needed him to be, handpicked by God and came through, who stayed in the game. 
I can't think of a greater honor than for our children to grow up and become the men and women that God is calling them to be. And Jesus, of course, is not the only example of that. It's still happening even today. Why don't you take a look at the screens for a modern day example? My name is Troy Kyle. Uh, my family and I have been at Faith Bridge for about three years now, maybe going on to four. During the summer, we had some friends out to the lake um, over a holiday weekend. And the kids, being kids, all wanted to go out on the golf cart. And the neighborhood's a closed off neighborhood, so there's really not a lot of cars to contend with, and we felt pretty safe. Uh, right after we kind of got lunch mostly prepared is when we got the first phone call. The first phone call was from one of the, the boys calling his mom, and he was frantic. He said, we've been in an accident uh, in the golf cart, and we need help now. We just were going down the hill, weren't slowing down, um, took a turn too fast, and flipped. I just remember being caught underneath. We took off flying as fast as we could to go find the kids. As I'm on the phone call, I hear my daughter in the background screaming, there is a hole in my knee. I start thinking about, oh my God, this, this is much worse than we thought it was. And as we pulled up on the accident, um, the entire golf cart was laying on its side. Kids were strewn about. Yes, when I looked down, my daughter had a four inch gash in her knee. Her leg was completely open. Uh, on that side, road rash up and down both legs. Off we went flying to the to the uh, emergency room. You can imagine three eighth grade girls screaming and crying in the car. Me and my friend Lainey were in the back and my friend Albert was in the front. Me and Delaney just started praying out loud. Um, I remember I was squeezing her hand so hard. You know, when you think about if it were you praying, Man, what I would I be praying for? <laughs> yeah, God, please stop this. Please fix me, please. You know, uh, you know, I would be asking for things. Not what happened at all. They started praying, and the first words out of their mouths were, "Thank you, thank you for looking after us. Thank you for being here for us." We were just talking to God and telling Him how great He was, and just thanking Him for us just being able to even get out of the situation. It was just this constant. Um, prayer of thanks that you heard from the back seat in the whole car at that time got quiet um, the mood kind of changed everything kind of and uh, that thankful prayer just kept going I've never heard um, a prayer like that I don't know what I thought she was learning in kids ministry you know it's almost like you know when I'm around my daughter. She's picking up and learning things from me, um, just being around me. Well, the same thing's happening at church. Uh, and being in that church body, she's learning um, better ways to go through life. Uh, and, the, and it's being exampled from the leaders down to her. And, and she's a shining example of those leaders' personalities and, and traits um, that they are exhibiting at church. I'm excited to see that it's working in her. My curious leader, been there for like maybe three years now, just from going every Wednesday night. She's one of those people that I really look up to because I've seen how she found Christ and how Christ has worked through her. I I'm hope I'm, you always hope you're doing the right thing. You hope that you're putting your kids in places where they're learning the right stuff. And that's what the youth ministry is doing right now. It's Everyone that she touches there is feeding her just a little bit more and a little bit more, but they're all feeding her the same story, which is great. Sydney actually ended up having to have surgery. Um, the plastic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon got in there, were able to determine that it had not invaded the knee. He told her as soon as she could walk on it, start walking on it. And volleyball season was two weeks away, and if you feel good, start playing. And watching her play volleyball uh, this season, um, as a dad, it makes you want to cry. To see it play out when it counts, right? Everyone can talk a good game, but you know, when your knee's ripped open and you're flying to a hospital, 
is much better than I would have done. I can tell you that had that my knee been ripped open, it would not have sounded anything like what came out of my daughter's mouth. It's humbled me quite a bit. It's made me so thankful. I'm not saying because she's up playing volleyball and running it that oh, I'm even more happy or more thankful. That whole incident, she could have, you know, something worse could have happened. Her knee could have been blown, volleyball shot, you know, whatever. That was not gonna shake my faith in God because in the back of that truck, she sat there thanking God. And it makes me realize that that's, that's the same prayer that's in my heart almost every day. You know, as I watched that, I thought that dad is so gracious and kind to give credit to kids' ministry and student ministry, and I'm sure it's well-deserved, but I also know this. It didn't start with them. It started with dad instilling that vision for life in his daughter. And what a beautiful way she then honored him. In a moment of greatest fear and greatest pain, where does she go? She goes to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is just awesome. Well, I, I, I want to take a, a pastoral moment, if you will, because I'm, I'm very much aware that on a day like today, there are uh, some dads here who, to be quite frank, um, haven't been in the game. And, and maybe your kids are gone. Or, or maybe you were in the game, but the way they're living right now isn't honoring you or God. Are you, are you saying, Pastor Dan, that, you know, I'm left out? No, I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. For one thing, Joseph didn't live to see how Jesus would ultimately honor him. And we may not live to see how our children will ultimately honor us, but here's what I do know beyond a shadow of a doubt. God loves your child even more than you do. And he will never, ever, ever give up on them. And our success or failure as a parent does not rest completely on our own abilities or inabilities. No, the future of our children and their lives, thank God, rests much more in the faithfulness of our God and not anything that maybe we got right or wrong. And so he's the one that we look to today because he's the one that will make all the difference I think today is a great day for us uh, as dads, as families, to remind ourselves, moms and dads alike, um, we need to be in the game. We need to be listening to him and obeying him so that one day that legacy will be passed on to our children. And so I thought it would be fitting if we closed our time by praying together that God would enable us to do that and that we would recommit ourselves to this beautiful task once more. Would you pray with me, please? (coughs) Father, how thankful we are for the gift of family that you designed us in such a way that we can be dads and moms and know the joy of parenting, even to know the struggles of parenting. We confess to you, Lord, that um, we haven't always done it just right. We haven't always been in the game. We're so easily distracted by our own agenda, the world. And so we ask you, Father, wherever we have fallen short, would you please forgive us today? Cleanse us and place within us 
a renewed desire to pick up where we left off, to get back in the game if that's what we need to do, to stay in the game if that's what we need to do, trusting all the while that your love exceeds anything that we do or fail to do. We entrust to you, O oh God, our ability as parents. We entrust to you our children, our grandchildren. And we ask above all, Lord, may you be glorified in what we do as parents and ultimately in the lives of our family. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen.